Hey there everybody, Lieutenant Mia here again with another video. This time we're going to be looking at the IFT, uh, Initial Flight Training Mission Data Card Overview slash mini tutorial slash thoughts and just some general advice for it. Uh, before I start this video, uh, I want to make a disclaimer as always. Again, this info is current as of June 2018, subject to change. Um, in addition, I'd like to say that if you decide to use any of this information, use it at your own discretion. Um, a lot of this is going to be personal technique. A lot of this is going to be just the way I like to do things and the way it helped me. But you are by no means required to learn it this way. And you might develop your own technique that works for you. <clears throat> I'm just giving this, uh, making this video to give some insight into just what a mission data card is and um, some tips and tricks that I learned from the IPs as well as some things that I learned from experience. Um, so that's just a disclaimer there. Uh, all of this information is uh, not classified and it's been approved by my flight commander so hopefully this doesn't come back to bite me in the butt. With that said, let's just get on with the video and um, We'll kick things off with the mission data card. Let's get that out of the way. We'll start with the blank one here. Now, I'm gonna apologize first and foremost. Hopefully this comes off clear. Uh, I'm working with a non-autofocus mode this time just because the text on this sheet is so small. So I'm gonna try my best to get this to look as clear as possible. And hopefully you guys can read it and um, follow along as I talk about the mission data card. So before I even go into this and start talking about the different components, of uh, the mission data card. Let's just talk about what a mission data card is. So a mission data card is basically a document that uh, you prepare prior to your sortie that serves as a template for the sortie and the flight that you're going to be doing. Now it also has information that you'll use to brief to your instructor pilot prior to going on your flight as well as some information that you'll use during the flight to make sure that your sortie objectives are being met. At first glance, it's a lot to take in, and the first few flights, it's definitely a lot to take in, but you'll find that as you progress through the syllabus and move on to your blocks or move in through your blocks, that it becomes easier and easier, and different pieces of the mission data card that seem foreign to you start to become more and more helpful, and you start to kind of understand what the different uh, sections are used for. Uh, a lot of this information you can prepare the day before or the night prior to your sortie, but a lot of the information cannot be factored in until uh, a few hours before your flight or an hour before your flight. Meaning, some sections can be completed and planned for early on, and some you'll have to wait uh, before you go up on your flight. And that can get tricky uh, with timing and the time you're supposed to fly and a few other factors. Now that seems confusing at first, but I'll talk about what I mean by that as we start talking about the different sections on the data card. So without further ado, let's kind of just jump into it. I can get this to focus. Just bear with me for a second. Okay, there we go. Now we'll start off from the top left and then work our way right and then down because that's kind of how you're supposed to uh, prepare this thing anyway. First things first, you want to look at the top of your mission data card. You'll notice that you have some information required for the left seat as well as the right seat. And then you'll see another section for weight and another section for weight here. Basically, what this refers to is your instructor pilot weight and your weight. Your instructor pilot will be sitting in the left seat and your weight and your own personal weight will be for the right seat. You can find your instructor pilot's weight under weather and planning uh, under the DOS intranet link and um, you can find out who your instructor pilot is for the sortie you'll be flying on your GTIM schedule. So find out the instructor pilot you'll be flying with, go to intranet, go to weather and planning, you'll see a document that says IP weights and then basically find your instructor, write his or her name, and then write his or her weight. And that's it for that section. For the right seat, you'll write your name and your weight. This info is going to come in handy later when you're configuring or when you're calculating some of the data 
um, your weights come into play for a couple of factors. That takes care of that section. Now we'll move on to this block here. Now, this section pretty much outlines, in a general sense, what your sortie is going to be. So, for example, we'll start with event. Event refers to what mission are you flying? What block are you in? And basically, uh, what your IP is expecting you to do for that sortie. Um, I'll just go off with one example here. Uh, N101. N101 refers to your first sortie or your dollar ride. Now you'll notice that the numbers uh, on the sortie have a particular correspondence. So let's just talk about that for a second. Any sortie that, has, that starts with a 1 is going to be your intro block. So 101 designates your first flight because it's in your, the 1 designates your 100 block, you're in your 100 block of training, and the 01 designates your flight, your first flight, 01. So 101. One meaning first block, 01 meaning the first flight. Then you can move on to N102 in your next flight. Now again, 1 designates you're still in your 100 block, but the 02 means you're in your second flight of your block. And as you progress through the syllabus, you'll move on to N201, N202, N203, and so on. Moving on to N301, 302, 303. The information that corresponds to those flights will be found in your CISO syllabus, and that can be accessed on the DOS website. So you'll write your event here. So if you're, for example, if you're going up on um, your first flight, your dollar ride, that's an N101. So you'd write N101 for your event. Simple as that. I feel like I talked a little too long about that, but a lot of people, for some reason, seem to have confusion about it, so I figure I'll talk about it. Next is your profile. The profile can also be found on the syllabus, and it refers to uh, what you'll be doing on that flight. So as a CISO, for example, uh, when you're in your 300 blocks, your profile might say 24-24. Uh, Y-A-K. What does that mean? So profile 24-Y-A-K as a CISO means you'll be flying to area 24 and you'll be flying the Y-A-K or YAK route. So you would write 24-Y-A-K. Again, that info can be found on the um, on your GTIM schedule and information about it can be found in the CISO playbook and syllabus. Next is areas. So areas will denote what area uh, are you flying to? Now I know it says parentheses S, areas, plural, but as a CISO, we'll only be flying to one area at a time. Pilots may have multiple areas, but as a CISO, you only need to worry about what area you'll be flying to. Now if we're referring back to our past example we just talked about, 24-YAK, 24-YAK, your area is going to be area 24. Just a little bit of insight moving forward with the profile. If your profile, for example, is 24 yak, you can know by looking at that that you'll be first going to area 24 and then doing the yak route. If it was reversed, for example, if it said yak-24, that would mean you're doing the yak route first and then doing uh, area work in area 24. All of this information can be found on GTIMS, and you can just write it out as you see it there. I just went on to more information uh, about it so you can um, just get some insight into what it's referring to. Next we're moving on to the training objectives block. Training objectives is unique in that there's no set way and there's no set reference as to what information you want for your training objectives. These in essence are just objectives you want to set for yourself and what you want to accomplish during your sortie. The main thing with training objectives when you're choosing them is making them quantifiable, and basically having a way to measure these objectives. You want to come up with objectives that are finite, that you can quantify. What I mean by that is, you don't want to write objectives like, I want to have a good flight. That's my first objective. For your second flight, uh, I want to enjoy the flight. And your third objective, for example, you, you don't want to write something like, um, let's see. 
I want to make my IP happy. Those things may be outcomes of the objectives you're shooting for, but you can't measure them. So some measurable training objectives, for example, would be, I want to complete my visual navigation route plus or minus 10 seconds. You can measure that. You can see how well you did and compare it against that objective to see if you met that objective. Another one might be, I want to successfully visually identify all of my route points. You can quantify that. Um, and another example might be, I want to have a perfect um, simulated forced landing. So those are all objectives, for example, that you can, you know, after the sortie, look back on and determine if you met those objectives or not. So when you're coming up with these, make sure that, again, they're quantifiable and they're measurable. And that takes care of this section. Now we're going to move on to the TOLD data. So TOLD, what does TOLD mean? TOLD is an acronym for takeoff and landing data. This information is going to be used um, prior to takeoff and when you're coming into land, as well as for emergencies, to refer to um, the distance of your runway and basically how much runway distance you need. Some of this information you're going to be able to calculate the day before or the night before, for example, but a lot of it is dependent on the day that you go flying. So some of the things that you can fill out are runway length, you can refer to your in-flight guide for the runway that you're taking off of to get that info, um, takeoff weight, we're always going to use the worst case scenario for takeoff weight um, just to keep our numbers conservative. So 1,764 is what you're always going to use for takeoff weight. Landing roll and a few of these other things are completely going to be dependent on factors that you'll get the morning of your sortie or the afternoon prior to your sortie. So temperature, pressure altitude, things like that are all going to change based on, based on the conditions, the atmospheric conditions of that day. So my general advice for this section would be Fill out what you can using your in-flight guide the day before, and then moving on to the next day, fill it out, um, I'd say about an hour prior to your sortie. But if you fill out what you can before, then it's just going to save you some time in the long run. Predominantly, pressure altitude and temperature are going to be the two things that you're going to need to wait for prior to your sortie moving in. And that takes care of your told data. Now you'll see multiple blocks here. Now really as a CISO, you're only ever going to use one. Pilots will have to worry about multiple sections because they do multiple runways, but CISOs were always taking off from Pueblo and landing at Pueblo. So it kind of makes it easier for us. Next we're going to move on to our area boundaries and obstacles section. Now this one's going to be hard, kind of hard to explain without a visual. So what I'll do is um, use one of my past mission data cards and kind of uh, show a uh, kind of a just the method I used and what you want to shoot for when you're doing this section of the data card. Try to kind of ignore the rest of this for now. We'll move on to them as I talk about it and we'll refer back to past mission data cards. For now just focus on this section. So let me get the autofocus going again. Area boundaries and obstacles. So this section refers to your area. And what I mean by that is we go, we look back to our profile and see what area we're going to be doing that day. So for this particular flight, I was doing profile 2-4 YAC, meaning I was going to be doing, you know, activity in area 2-4. That's pretty simple. What you're going to need to do is look on Google Earth on the DOS issued computer and you'll see that the overlays, uh, that they have overlays for the various different areas on Google Earth, and it makes it really easy for you to kind of get a visual idea of what the area looks like. So I know for this mission, I'm doing Area 2-4. So I'd go to Google Earth, I'd hover over Area 2-4, and I would zoom out until I got a complete picture of the area. So this is what my sketch of Area 2-4 looks like. Now, this is where things get kind of tricky because the key to making this section useful is drawing a good you know, sketch of your area that you can refer to to find your visual boundaries, but not drawing too much that it's cluttered. Because your IP wanna, IPs want to see that you have a good general understanding of your uh, areas 
and that you can visually identify the different boundaries of your area. So hypothetically, what they are wanting you to accomplish using this sketch is if you didn't have your GPS in your cockpit to refer to what your area looks like, well, how would you be able to, to figure out, okay, am I getting too close to one edge that I'm gonna leave my area? Or, you know, am I too far away from the, the force landing site I'm looking for, this black dot here? How am I gonna know if I don't have my GPS? That's what you use this section for. You wanna look at Google Earth and you wanna find key landmarks that'll help you sort of get a rough idea of where your aircraft is and where you are trying to go without your GPS. And that's why it's called visual uh, boundaries because you're visually identifying what your boundaries are. Some personal technique that I like to use for this section is um, I like to write my different directions on each corner of my area. So for example, um, this, this uh, boundary to the very right is my southern boundary. So 180 is my heading there. This is my western boundary, 270. This is my northern boundary, 360. And uh, eastern is 90, 090. And why that comes in handy is because while you're so task saturated in the cockpit, you can just use your heading indicator to kind of get a rough idea of which way your aircraft is facing. And that way, when you know which way you're facing, you'll know which way to look for these different landmarks. So for example, if my aircraft was flying to the east, I would know if I look to the right, I should see this crop circle here, and I should be able to see these uh, different terrains that I outlined here, whether it's a road or a mountain or um, some kind of patch or whatever you decide to draw, you just have that reference. Uh, conversely, if, I was, if my aircraft was flying to the south, if my heading was 180, then I should just look straight ahead and I should be able to identify this crop circle as well as this road. Now, this takes some practice in getting used to, and it's just personal technique on how much you like to draw. I've seen some people like that barely draw anything and they're able to navigate um, pretty easily, but it's all dependent on what's gonna help you out. So this is all personal technique. Um, I just know some IPs get a little picky when you don't have a lot drawn on there. So it kind of depends on who you fly with. And that covers it for area boundaries and obstacles. Another personal technique I'd like you to, um, well, at least that I incorporated, that I think would be helpful for a lot of people is on Google Earth, you'll see a black dot and you'll see some numbers. That basically refers to the elevation of your forced landing site. I like to draw that in because it's good visual or it's a good uh, numerical reference. So when you're flying, you'll know um, what numbers to use for um, your simulated forced landing when you get to that. I know I'm kind of moving ahead and talking about things I haven't touched on yet. Just keeping it short, uh, write that number in as well because it's gonna help you uh, for the next step of your CISO uh, portion, CISO flight. Okay, I'm going to put this away because it's got a lot of stuff, but we will, we will come back to this. I'm going to go to the blank one um, just so I can keep talking about this and walking you guys through it. Let's get the focus back. Okay, next we're looking at our area FL site information. What is this talking about? Well, area of force landing is what area FL stands for. This refers to the area work that you'll do as a CISO. Um, eventually you're going to get to a point where all CISO missions are going to be the same. And that's uh, about a little into your 300 block. And it's going to be, you'll fly out of Pueblo, you'll go to an area, you'll do your area work, then you'll do a VNAV route and then come back home. And the area work you do is always going to be a force landing, a simulated force landing. And that's what this block is used for. It kind of gives you the information. Let's see if I can get to focus a little better. It gives you the information you need to refer to the parameters for your force landing. And we'll talk about that from top to bottom. Starting from the top, TDP. TDP refers to your touchdown point. This is, where is the aircraft, wh where are you going to land the aircraft if your engine were to stop? So, now that I'm thinking about it, talking through this section is going to be a lot easier if we refer to one that I've already filled out from a prior sortie. So I apologize for that. But the information that I'm trying to explain remains the same. So TDP. TDP refers to the touchdown point. So if I was flying, for example, over area 24 here, where am I gonna land? Is it gonna be a patch of grass over here? 
Is it gonna be a dirt road over here? For me, it was this dirt road. And you can be pretty vague with it, so I just wrote dirt road. Landing direction. You'll notice that I highlighted this section. And I highlighted it because this is one of those sections that you'll need to fill out prior to your sortie. This isn't something you can fill out the night before because your landing direction is gonna be completely dependent on the winds for that day. A rule of thumb to remember is that when you come in to do your force landing, you, you're always gonna to wanna to land with a headwind. You don't wanna land with a tailwind. So this is gonna vary based on which way the winds are coming from. And what I like to do, another personal technique, is I look on the weather tool for that day, the Java weather tool, and I like to see which way the winds are coming from. So for, for example, this particular day I wrote, landing direction is gonna to be to the west. Well, how did I determine that? If I'm landing to the west, if I'm landing to the west, that would mean my winds for that day are generally gonna be coming from 270. So if my winds are coming from 270, that means the winds are blowing this way. And I'm gonna to wanna to land against the wind. So my direction is gonna to be to the west. Now let's reverse that. What would happen if the winds were coming from 090? If my winds were coming from 090, that means the winds are blowing down this way. And I'm gonna to wanna to land against the wind. So I would be landing to the east. Hypothetically, again, if the lands were, winds were coming from 180, I would want to land to the south. And if my winds were coming from 360, I would want to land to the north. So this, you want to look maybe like an hour prior to your sortie, look which way the winds are blowing, and then make a decision of which way you're going to land your aircraft if you had to, based on that. The next piece of information is your high key information. So before I touch on this, I want to make sure I have my notes right here. So just bear with me for a second. Sorry, folks. I had this here a second ago. One sec, I just don't want to get this information wrong. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. So, the next piece of information you're gonna calculate is your high key. So a high key refers to your aircraft when it's in a certain position. And what that position is, let's just say you start going into your simulated force landing. You're gonna start doing, you know, you're gonna start descending in altitude as you start kind of doing circles over your force landing site. Your high key point is in reference to when your aircraft is above, um, is one third over your force landing site uh, point. So for example, this road here, when the aircraft reaches the first third and I'm over that point, your high key altitude should be a certain altitude. And you calculate that using a pretty simple formula. You just take the elevation of your touchdown point and you add 1,600 feet to it. So for my high key point for this specific example, I would take 4,276 and add 1,600 to it. You'll get whatever number you have, and then you round it up to the nearest 100. If I were to add 1,600 to this, uh, my mental math isn't the best. It'd be something, something, you know, 76 or some kind of rough number. I round it up to 5,900. And the reason you do that is because um, when you're gauging your high key altitude, you're gonna be using the altimeter in the aircraft and it goes by 100s. So getting small finite numbers are pretty much not very feasible using the human eye. So you wanna have something that you can gauge with the altimeter better and rounded numbers work better for that. Next is your low key altitude. Your low key refers to your aircraft when it's 
um, parallel or adjacent to the runway. And that altitude is determined by adding 800 feet to this number and then rounding that to the nearest 100 as well. So for example, this one would be 4,276 plus 800 and then that would give you your low key altitude and then you round it out. The next is your go around altitude and you determine that by subtracting um, you know what this one I'm drawing a blank on this one I would consult with an IP or a flight mate because that one I'm just drawing a blank on for some reason but we'll move on threats and hazards basically just refers to the various threats that you can potentially expect in your forced landing site so if I'm landing on this road some threats I can expect would be cars or um, cattle or basically things that might be near this road, towers, things like that. Just look on Google Earth and find the different things that um, might be in the area. Moving on, I'll put the uh, example one away and go back to the blank one so it doesn't give you guys a migraine. The next one is risk management. Risk management basically refers to uh, how capable are you that day to fly. Uh, refer to the in-flight guide for risk management, the pages that talk about the different components that factor in. Um, some of those include fatigue, uh, which sortie you're in, are you on academic, uh, or do you have any academic holds, any flying holds. This number will determine if you are fit to fly for that day. And the second number refers to your IPs risk management score. So you'll have a score, leave the second one blank, they'll have a score, and then you'll total it just before you step out to the aircraft. It's very unlikely that you'll ever get a risk management score that equals a number that will prohibit you from flying, but it's a possibility. So they like you doing this. Um, some factors I can think of off the top of my head are again fatigue, um, you could talk about uh, if you're doing a VNAV route as a CISO, a visual navigation route, that's an automatic point. There's a few things that will automatically add points. So even if you think you're fine to fly, there's some default points that will get added. So refer to those pages, and your IP will ask you how you got your risk management score. So be prepared to kind of refer and remember how you got to the number that you did. This next block refers to um, your step, takeoff, and landing times. So your land time will be found on GTIMS. Your takeoff time is going to be 30 minutes prior, or actually, your takeoff time. Let, let me. Okay, I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to redo all of that. So ignore what I just said, and we'll start from the top. Your takeoff time can be found on your GTIMS schedule, as well as your land time. So those things can be filled in directly from your GTIMS schedule. The step time is basically your takeoff time minus 30 minutes. So for example, if your takeoff time is 10.30, your step time will be 10 o'clock. Your land time is also provided on the schedule. The next is your DR slash VNAV route uh, area and pattern times. These are all gonna be different entry times and they're all gonna be calculated uh, based roughly on um, some calculations you'll do yourself a lot of this you'll kind of have to gauge. Uh, a rule of thumb for kind of determining these numbers would be to go on Google Earth, use the ruler tool, get the distance of the different areas you'll be flying to, the different um, kind of routes you'll take to get to where you're getting, and do a rough mental estimate. A good rule of thumb is that it will fly about, um, let's see, what's the rule of thumb here? Every minute you'll fly about two miles. So use that to kind of calculate the different entry times and uh, the different times you'll take to get to certain areas. Sounds a little complicated. Honestly, this section just takes practice. What I can do is kind of walk you through an example one. Ignore the rest of this, but we'll talk about this time. So the takeoff and landing time, I got off GTIMS. Step time is just 30 minutes minus takeoff time. So I'll walk you through how I calculated these numbers.
for this specific profile. My takeoff time is 10.30. I know that because it's given to me on GTIMS. Now I'll look at my profile. What am I doing? I'm doing area 24 first, and then I'm going to yak, and then I'm coming home. So I know for this section, I'll need to do my area entry first, because I'm going to my area first, because it's 24-yak, not yak-24. So I need to calculate my time from my takeoff to my area. What I'll do is I'll go on Google Earth, I will look, I use the ruler tool, and I'll measure from Pueblo to area 24, the distance of how long that is, use my rule of thumb, uh, two miles every minute, and then calculate my entry time to my area based on my takeoff time. So my takeoff time here took off at 10.30, and I should be at my area at 10.50, because 20 minutes is what I calculated um, for my flight time to get to my area. Next, I'll look at my exit time. Um, Notice I gave myself about 15 minutes, so my 10.50 to 11.05 refers to my area work. As a CISO, you'll always do the same area work, which is a simulated forced landing, and that takes about 15 minutes to do. So your entry time plus 15 minutes will give you your exit time for your area. Now look back at my profile. So I always kind of keep reminding myself what I'm doing. I'm doing area 2-4, then yak for this specific mission. Doing area 2-4, then yak. So then I need to calculate from my area exit to my VNAV route, because Yak is my VNAV route. Now I know I'll be exiting at 11.05, and I'll be entering Yak um, at 11.08. I calculated this the same way I did my takeoff to my area time. I measured the distance from area 24 to the Yak route, and it was just a couple of miles. So that's why you can see that my area exit time, 11.05, to my G, uh, to my VNAV entry time, 11.08, is only three minutes because they're pretty much right next to each other. All this info is going to vary based on um, your particular mission, your particular area, as well as your uh, profile for that day. So I wish I could explain this in a very concrete, this is what you have to do type of way, but all of this is going to vary on your mission. But hopefully that gave some info and shed some light. Next and lastly is your patterns. Your patterns refers to um, coming back home to Pueblo and landing at Pueblo. I usually like to give myself about 15 minutes here too. So that's why you'll see my entry time is 11.42. And my exit time, which refers to my landing time, is about 15 minutes. And you can kind of see that the exit time for your pattern is going to be the same as your land time. So that's just a nice little rule of thumb. And my entry time for my pattern is based on my exit time from whatever so, uh, profile I was doing. So for, again, I keep coming back to this. I'm doing area 2-4 and then yak. My entry time into my pattern is going to be the time I exit yak to fly back to Pueblo. So I'll use my ruler tool on Google Earth, find the distance from yak back to Pueblo, do my rule of thumb about two miles a minute, and then I'll get that entry time from my VNAV exit time. So 11.28 to 11.42 is how long it should take me to fly back from that yak route back to Pueblo to land. And then I give myself 15 minutes to do my patterns. And the patterns of the CISO that you'll do for landing luckily doesn't change either. We'll always do one normal pattern which is a touch and go. Sometimes if you don't have enough time, your IP may not let you do a touch and go. And then we'll do another simulated force landing, but this time it'll be a full stop. Okay, so that takes care of that section. We'll go back to the blank sheet now. <clears throat> this section here, KPUB status, um, you can pretty much write in any notes that you feel is necessary for that day. Uh, if a certain runway is closed, for example, or there's limitations on um, takeoff parameters, you can write that. For the most part, I kind of left this section blank. Um, there's not very often, there's not very many times when I find myself writing notes here. Next, blank status. This is for pilots. As CISOs, you can ignore this. 
This is for any other airport you might be using, but as a CISO, we'll never use another airport unless it's an emergency. So this is kind of nice. You can use this section to write in notes that you might need. And the next section is your NOTAMS and TFR section. NOTAMS is another acronym for Notice to Airmen. Notice to Airmen. It's basically any specific notes that the FAA or um, airport officials want uh, airmen who are training to have some information about referring to runways. You'll get this information at your um, formal brief that you'll do with your flight every morning. And if there's anything noteworthy to kind of brief to your IP, you'll want to write that here. Again, with this, for the most part, I found this section empty. And in general, I found myself using this whole block just to take notes for my flight and my sortie. Uh, I've got a bunch of example mission data cards that I'll kind of give some insight into in a little bit, and you'll see what I mean by that. But as far as the information goes, that's what should go there. And that takes care of this whole top block, so we're almost done. Uh, we're about halfway done, but you know what I mean. So the next is the sign out and step time. Um, this stuff I kind of pretty much ignored. I never really use this area, so maybe consult with an IP or some flight mates about that. As far as I recall, I never touched that section. Soft notes and instructions. Um, so soft refers to some people in the tower who may provide you some information as you're flying, uh, dependent on think on conditions that change as you're flying. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, one time I took off for a sortie with my IP. We were headed to an area and uh, we were supposed to maintain 6,500 um, prior to climbing to 7,000 uh, in terms of altitude to get to my area, but there was a cloud ceiling at 7,000 feet. And when you're flying a DA-20 and any time you're flying at Pueblo, we're all flying VFR, meaning we're not using any instruments. We're just using eyeballs to fly. And there was a cloud cover at 7,000 feet. So SOF basically told us, hey, there's some clouds. Make sure you maintain 6,000. Don't climb to 7,500. In that case, I would write the soft note, maintain 6,000 feet flying to your area, or 6,500, uh, whatever they direct you to do. So this sometimes gets used, sometimes it doesn't. Most of the time it doesn't, but the potential does exist. Potential conflicts, you can kind of ignore that and never use that. Your tail and call sign info, you'll get this information as you go to the step room. The step room is where you'll receive your tail number, as well as your call sign. So your tail number goes first. Um, your tail number refers to the aircraft you'll be flying that day. So it could be, you know, uh, aircraft 620. If that's your aircraft, you'll see it on the screen. You'll write in 620, and you'll get your, t your call sign for that day, Tiger blank. That refers to um, your call sign during the mission. We're all Tigers, and I believe it goes up to Tiger 60, something like that. And it can be 01 through 060, or I think that might be wrong, but you're going to be a Tiger of some kind of number. So it could be Tiger 24, Tiger 44, whatever it is, you'll receive it um, prior to stepping to your aircraft. This section here is CISOs. We don't use, uh, as far as I recall, so I just ignore this section. And that's here, that section. Now we're looking at the different radio frequencies. I'm going to go back to a prior data card, a prior mission data card that I used for this section just to kind of highlight how easy it is and how easy we have it as CISOs um, for this section. Now pilots, from my understanding, all of these frequencies are fair game and they might have to use these. But you'll notice that I highlighted a few and that's because as CISOs we're only going to be using these ones here, the ones that are highlighted. So most notably Pueblo Ground and Pueblo Tower that's what you'll use prior to takeoff. Then right before takeoff, you'll want to switch to Denver approach and then have Tiger traffic loaded on your COM2. Sounds confusing. You'll get the hang of it as you start flying. But what I want you guys to kind of take away from this is it helps to highlight the frequencies we'll be using. So you can kind of just take a quick glance. If you need to refer, get a quick little memory refresher. Having them highlighted definitely helps. And that takes care of frequencies. As CISOs, we only really need to focus on that. You might need to use these for emergencies, uh, emergency landings, but as far as I know, that hasn't happened in a long time. That okay, takes care of that. I'll fold this just so we can get some more visual on it. 
Next, we've got your ATIS info. And ignore all this. I'll touch on that later. In fact, let's just put that away and we'll go to the clear one to talk about it so it doesn't look as confusing. This section is going to be for your ATIS. And what that means is the information that you'll receive from ATIS, the automated whatever system, I forget what the acronym stands for, will go on this section here. So you'll do, for example, you'll do your engine start, and then you'll be doing your avionics check checklist. And part of that is collecting ATIS info. So you'll tune your, um, your frequency to the ATIS, and it'll give you information such as um, the current information, the winds, visibility, sky conditions, temperature, dew point, altimeter. The main ones to kind of take away are the altimeter setting, uh, temperature dew point, your winds, and the current information. So whether that's Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, whatever it is, you want to make sure you have those because prior to taxiing out of the gate, or right after taxiing out, I should say, you'll contact Public Ground and you'll tell them, hey, I listen to ATIS. This is the information that I have. I want a taxi to this runway to take off. And if you have the wrong information, they're not going to let you taxi or your you know, IP is going to correct it for you. But you know, that's something you're being graded on. So make sure you have the correct info prior to t uh, taxi. For example, uh, if you're listening and it says, you know, ATIS, information, Romeo, and you taxi out and you say, hey, Pueblo Ground, I have information, Romeo, but the most current information is information, Juliet, they're not going to, you know, they're going to be like, say again, do you have the correct info? So just make sure you're paying right, uh, the uh, right amount of attention to that. And that basically covers it. So the ATIS info you'll uh, do once while you're um, doing your engine start and kind of taxiing out of the gate there, prior to taxiing out of the gate. And you'll do it a second time as you are heading back home, either after you leave your area or after you leave your VNAV route. So two of these blocks will be filled out on your way back. Or one of these will be filled out on your way back. One of these will be filled out on your way out. But you don't fill any of this out the night before. Now the rest of this mission data card is for you to use um, with whatever notes you want to put that might help you for your flight. And with that, I will kind of go on to some um, advice about what notes might be helpful. And I'll give you some introspection into some of my early mission data cards and my last mission data cards to kind of see how you grow as a CISO and just how, th how much things change when you start to understand and you become more familiar with it. And what I mean by that is when you first start doing your sorties, you're very dependent on these cards, almost to the point where you feel nervous without referring to them constantly. But as you get more and more uh, acclimated with your sorties and the card itself, a lot of it starts becoming muscle memory and a lot of it starts becoming natural. So we'll just start with my second to last sortie that I did. Here's some notes that I took uh, on the card. And I'll try to get the focus going again. So again, here's just some personal technique. Uh, feel free to use this or don't. This is just what helped me. So at the very top, when I knew my sortie was scheduled on GTIMS, the first thing I like to do is I like to write in what time my formal brief was for that day and then what time my flight was. Just so I don't have to keep referring to the computer to remember when my information uh, is for my flight. So I'd recommend doing that. Write what time you'll be doing your formal, formal brief with your flight and then write what time you're supposed to go fly. On the very top left, I like to write my departure OBS and that's just in case I have like a mental block and I'm kind of freezing on which way I'm supposed to take off. I always highlight it in red and that just lets me know, hey, I'm going to be leaving using a 210 OBS radial. Next over here, like I mentioned, we don't really use this section that much. So I'd always use this to kind of write an overview of my profile for that day. So we'll refer to what I was doing that day, profile N305. So I'm in my 300 block, my fifth sortie, 
going to area one. I'm doing my area first. There's that one, and I'm doing my uh, ZFR visual navigation route, my Zamfir route. So I'm doing area one first, then I'm going to Zamfir. That's my general sortie. But if I want to be more specific, this is what the in-flight guide was telling me to do. It was telling me I need to have a south departure. I need to go to area one. I'll do my Zamfir. Uh, then I'll take ranch and then I'll head home. This is straight out of the in-flight guide. I just like writing it here and highlighting it in case I need a quick reference as to where I am in the mission and where I'm headed to next in case I have a, a mental freeze. Uh, next, I like to write in my approach briefing. A lot of this you don't want to be dependent on, but I write this info because it kind of just helps me um, get a quick refresher if I'm in a portion of my flight where I'm just flying straight and level. Sometimes I'll just like look back at this info to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, so for example, this is when I'm coming back home, my approach briefing will be uh, coming in runway either 8, eight left or 26 left via right or left pattern, 5,500 feet. I'll tell that to my IP and that's one more thing I can knock out. Just a quick little reference here, it doesn't hurt to have it. As you can see here, this is a different mission data card, but I still like to highlight all my key um, radio frequencies. I've always liked to do those before my takeoff, um, just in case uh, I forget what my frequencies are, and that way I don't have to scan across too many lines, it doesn't get confusing. Those are my different informations for that day, for my ATIS, leaving and coming back. I don't know why it's so janky, but <laughs> you can ignore that. Now, here's something that helped me a lot, that I learned from another pilot, and he was telling me, Your uh, routes that you're going to be taking for your sortie, you should always write uh, your departure and your arrival, both of them, for both runways. Because, and it's happened to me as well, they can close the runway you were planning on using to come back and have you use an opposite runway based on the winds. So you can plan all day to use runway 8 right, and then you can taxi out there and then they'll say, hey, guess what? The winds are too strong. We're not using runway eight right. Go to runway two six left. And then what do you do? You gotta think on your feet and you don't have time to refer to your in-flight guide without looking like a bumbling moron. So what I like to do is just write my different um, runways that I'll be using and the steps to which I'll be taking to either depart or come back home. So I highlight my runway two six information and then I leave my runway 8 right or 8 left information unhighlighted. That way, mentally, I'll remember, you know, if they're telling me 2-6, I'll just look for the highlight. So this, this is my departure info up here. So if I'm departing using runway 2-6 left, and I'm headed to area 1, what I'm going to have to do is I'll take off, I'll head to yard, then I'll head to bend at 6,500 feet, then I'll direct to Alpha 1 at 7,500 feet, or Area 1. What if I'm taxiing out there and then runway 8 right gets closed? Well, no problem. I still have my notes for runway 26, and I'll just use that. I'm taking off runway 26. Instead of going to Yard, I'm going to Plant at 6,500, and then I'm going to Area 1, 7,500 feet. Simple as that. What I like to do is if I'm taxiing out there and this happens to me, and for some reason it happened a lot to me, it happened like three times, I'll just straight up, I'll just cross out runway 8 right, because that becomes irrelevant to me, because they told me to use runway 26 left. Same concept coming back. Just say I'm heading home. If I'm directed to use runway 26, my route is going to be bridge to gyro, 6,500 feet, follow the power lines to breaker, and then I'll go to initial. And again, flip-flop, if runway 26 left was not the one they told me to use, they told me to use runway 8 right or left, my route would be go to bridge, 6,500 feet, then to back 9, descend to 6,000, and then I'll do my 92 initial. All this info, having it at a glance, is a lot more helpful, at least to me, than to have to constantly refer to my in-flight guide when everything is just condensed. And in conjunction with all of this info, having it just, you know, in the same vicinity makes it a lot easier 
to uh, kind of get your game plan ready for either departing or coming back home. Now all this info is in your in-flight guide, but if you do some shorthand writing, like shorthand like I do, it kind of helps you condense all that info into one segment that will help you uh, have a better mission flow. Lastly, a lot of IPs frown on this, but it worked for me and I graduated, so you know, use this if you like, is call order. I know some IPs don't even like you, like you writing down radio calls, but you know, at your discretion, I guess, kind of work with whatever works for you. But I like to basically write shorthand notes of all of my radio calls that I'm doing up until I come home. But I'm not writing them out explicitly like essays. I'm writing shorthands and I'm writing the key pieces of information that I need to write. So for, for example, for this profile, profile 1ZFR uh, N305, my radio calls are going to be from top to bottom. After I've taken off, because I've already memorized that, I'd say Denver departure, Tiger 65, South departure, climbing 6,500, Area 1. I'm just letting Denver departure know, hey, I'm doing a South departure and I'm headed to Area 1 climbing at this altitude. After I've auto-terminated with them, I'll contact Tiger traffic, Tiger traffic, uh, Tiger whoever, South departure, Area 1. Now I'm letting the Tiger traffic, all the other aircraft in my vicinity, know I am this aircraft, I took a South departure, and I'm headed to Area 1. One minute prior to entering Area 1, I'll just say Tiger 5-0 or whatever, Tiger blank, entering Area 1. Same thing, just letting Tiger traffic know. I'm also going to let Tiger traffic know when I exit Area 1 by saying Tiger blank, exiting Area 1, entering Zamfir. So I'm letting them know I'm exiting my area, I'm entering my route, my visual navigation route. Then after I exit Zamfir, I'll let Tiger traffic know, hey, Tiger blank, exiting Zamfir, inbound ranch. Letting them know, hey, I'm done with my area, I'm heading home using ranch. After I'm done with that, I'm going to let Denver Approach know, hey, Denver Approach, I'm at ranch, Tiger 5-0, whatever, ranch, 6,500, information, blank. So this time I'm letting Denver Approach know I'm at ranch, my altitude is 6,500, information XX refers to the information that I gathered from the ATIS on my way back. So this is kind of tricky, it's because something you have to get used to juggling, collecting your ATIS info um, on your way back, because Denver Approach needs to know that you have the most current information for ATIS. Then after Denver Approach, I'll contact Pueblo Tower, say so Pueblo Tower, I'm at bridge, um, I want runway XX depending on whatever ADIS told me to use. Request one pattern, request descent, base, and then they'll clear you for the option. And then after you've landed, you'll contact Public Ground, uh, request taxi to DOS. So this is kind of shorthand notes of all my calls in case I kind of stumble or forget one. And it's kind of shorthand for everything. So this is how your mission data card, if you're good, this is like the max amount of notes you should have by the time you enter your 300 block. Um, I'm going to unfocus this and I'll kind of show you the evolution of what my data cards look like. So this is towards the end here. Let me show you one of my first ones. So just look at how much info is in here. No highlights, no sections, uh, d d you know, designated with any special attention, no bold. Like I was looking at this in flight and wasn't able to pick out any information because it just looks like an essay. All my radio calls weren't shorthand, they were all written out completely, and there was just so much info that I didn't even know what I was looking at. And if your IP sees you pull out a mission data card with this much info on it, they're pretty much going to know you're not prepared for your sortie. And this reflected a bad sortie, while this reflected a good sortie. I'll show you a few more. So this is getting better. Still a lot more info, but you can see I'm starting to kind of trim the fat. I'm starting to learn what works for me. And then things are getting even a little bit better. A little less info. This is moving into my 200 block, I believe, or uh, towards the end of my 100 block. And then you can really see how the more confident you get, the less information you'll have on your mission data card. And you'll just see that uh, progress as you go into your... Uh, later blocks, notably your 300 blocks, 
where you start getting more and more familiar with this and you don't rely on it as much. Now that was basically the mission data card quick and dirty overview, just some tips and tricks that I like to do. Um, trying to think of what else for now that I didn't miss on. Uh, that basically covers it, I think, for the core info. Next time, um, I'll be taking a look at the back section. This is the IFT Form 70 for CISOs, and I'll do a quick walkthrough on that, and kind of in coordination with the WizWheel tutorial, show you how to fill this out as well. So we'll look at that next time. But that about covers it for the mission data card. And I hope, uh, hopefully that's been helpful. If you guys have any questions, as always, go ahead and comment. Um, for those of you who haven't gone yet and looked at this and are thinking, wow, what am I looking at? That's perfectly natural. That's how it was even while I was there, even into my, some of my later 100 blocks, I was still like, what am I looking at? It doesn't really click for me until like the end of my 100 block. So it's going to take some time before all of this starts to feel natural just because there's so much info being thrown at you especially if you don't have a lot of prior flight experience. But just keep at it. The more you practice with these, the better you'll get. And um, yeah, that about covers it for the mission data cards. Like always, um, if you have any questions, let me know. But until next time, I will see you guys later.